All right, so just to find out if people have any specific questions with regards to what we covered um, the last time we met. So we started our discussion on lecture series number 14, which is number systems and representation. And we, we actually started off by, um, by uh, we're going to continue with uh, these different usage scenarios, just trying to set the stage for um, application of these things we're calling number systems, right? It turns out that uh, information when it comes to computing is sometimes conveyed using certain number bases. Um, so we, we discovered that in fact, what we had discussed as part of lecture series number 15, this whole notion of how permissions uh, represented numerically on Unix-like operating systems actually makes use of, of base eight, which is why the maximum possible number that you can have associated with either one of those three groupings is a seven. The minimum is obviously a zero, right? And we've seen this over and over again. So if you look at uh, this particular screen grab here, you realize that uh, the permission here is 600, right? 600, yeah? Uh, we discovered that the maximum possible permission that you could have is a triple seven, right? Which means everybody has read, write, and execute okay. access, right? So just setting the stage here, and then we also um, uh, highlighted the fact that uh, some of these errors that we get to come across when we are using um, our devices, our computer systems, um, a la, we latched onto the so-called Windows blue screen of death, right? Usually this, um, this memory dump, um, which, which you have access to or have a hexadecimal representation there, right? So these are different use cases. And, and of course, uh, it's unfortunate that you haven't really started looking at computer networks and the internet, but very, very soon you discover that the representation of so-called IP addresses, right? You know, pro pro protocol ad addresses are represented using specific number systems. For instance, IPv4 uh, uses so-called dotted decimal notation, right? Where each one of these different groupings is. So the 127 is a decimal number, right? Zero versus a decimal, zero is a de decimal, one is a decimal, right? But with IPv6, things are somewhat changing because um, the idea behind IPv6, we, we don't know yet, but the idea behind IPv6 is to, to enable the representation of slightly more remote devices or network devices and because the numbers you're working with are significantly larger than with IPv4. Um, the representation is done using hexadecimal, right? FE80, this is hexadecimal. Um, Right. But it turns out that there's, there's actually more things here. And in fact, I'm, I'm sure you've, you've seen these on your devices. Sometimes when you access, uh, anyway, when you access your phone, uh, your about, uh, you, you go to your about, is it the settings and then about, you notice that you see strange things like, um, I don't know if people have bothered to look at things like um, MAC addresses, for instance, right? If you check this, is it the stat status or on the, it's the status, right? So you go to about, and then you go to your status. In my case is on the status. Um, you have access to so-called IP, uh, to so-called uh, uh, MAC addresses, right? Your MAC address is represented using hexadecimal format. And there's more, right? There's more. Uh, very, very soon, perhaps in third year, you discover that certain nifty tools like uh, vision control software, such as, uh, Git or Mercurial, for instance, will typically represent the commit messages using, uh, I don't know if this is base 36, I think. It should be base 36, but this is a um, SHA-1 hash, right? It's a crypt crypto cryptographic hash, but these numbers that you're seeing here up on top there, these numbers here, this string here, this is represented using a certain type of number system, right? And if you think about it, you can easily, you can easily figure out what, what sort of number system or, or the, the different types of characters that are being used here. You notice here that the range of characters that are being used, simple, right? It's, uh, it's A through Z, right, all our case, and zero through nine. If you count these, it's 26 plus 10, which is 36, right? This is what you have here. And I can showcase, I guess, a simple example um, so that people kind of like uh, get a sense of what we're talking about here. I don't know if you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Yes, yeah. 
Right. So, I mean, this is what I'm talking about here. If you look at the pattern here, the pattern associated with commit here, all these commit messages here, commit one, commit two here, you notice that there's a pattern here. It's numbers and lowercase alphabetic, uh, alphabetic characters, right? English characters, characters from the English alphabet, all lowercase. Um, uh, and the combination of all these different characters is 26 plus, plus 10, right? Because the numbers you're, you're playing around with here is zero through nine, if you notice. In here you have three, seven, eight, seven, eight, seven, one, three, three, eight, one, seven, one, nine, seven, nine, five, zero, three, nine, three, right? So um, all classic examples of how, uh, of how uh, these different bases or numbers tend to be used, right? Um, and it turns out really that uh, this has a very powerful use, by the way, uh, for a, a particular repository that you work with, each of these commit messages is essentially uh, unique, right? It's a unique representation of the save point you're working with. Um, and so the idea behind version control is that you can roll back to a particular point in time in your repository so that you access content in that repository at a particular point in time in the past, right? Um, all because of the power of, I guess, commit messages that are represented in, in this case, it's base 36. Gets even better. These uh, links that I've been sharing, I don't know if people have been paying particular attention to this, but but usually when when I when I'm sharing links, for the most part, I track those links. I, I I'm interested in tracking how uh, <clears throat> how the extent to which people are using or accessing the resource I'm sharing. So I use uh, uh, services that are referred to as URL shorteners. Right? There's a whole bunch of them. There used to be a Google URL shortener called Google.gl, uh, right? It's it's now defunct. It's been phased out. Um, I've replaced. I've since replaced it personally myself with Bitly, right? But there's more out there. There's tiny URL. Um, so the idea behind this is that if you have the long URL, right, the informal resource locator, what you can do is, what you can do is, you can shorten it, so that, so that people can easily share that resource rather than you sharing something that is going to be multiple characters long, like this, right? Instead of me sharing this link here, yeah? This link here, which is long, right? Very long. What I do is I shorten it using Bitly, and then what I do is I share this. So this, what you're seeing in line number 10 is the equivalent of this long link here, right? But the key thing here is that uh, the way URL shorteners work is they, well, they work in different ways, but the fundamental idea is that uh, there's a mechanism in place that shortens this long URL here into the equivalent shorter version of it. So this. Now, if you pay particular attention to the last bit after the forward slash, you yeah. notice that this number system, um, uh, you notice that these characters are represented using a particular type of number system for Bitly in this case, right? Um, now I'll give it away here. You notice that it's represented using lowercase characters and uppercase characters um, and numbers as well. Yes. Um, uh, does is version control the same thing we use when uh, our computer is attacked by uh, ransomware, but we want to restore it at a previous at a previous time? No, that's a different concept. It's different. The idea is pretty much so the same, that you can access files before they were affected. Yeah, no, that's something else. That's different. No, it's not, it's not vision control. It's different. Else. You typically use it. Yeah. Nope, that's something else. But, but the idea is the same. What you are interested in is a, a restore point, right? A particular point in time that you want to go back to. But it's, it's completely different from what we're talking about here. All right, uh, so, but you've seen, you've probably seen this as well uh, when you're accessing uh, uh, YouTube, right? So if I go to YouTube, for instance, um, and I try to access, uh, I don't know what to access here, but, well, uh, I guess, can I access uh, Love and Monsters? I don't know. Uh, Monsters, Sibling and Siege for Life. If we, if we can access, um, we can access uh, a video, right? What you notice is that ideally the original URL, right? It's the same idea, right? I'm just saying here. Yeah. Well, Although this is short and easier way, it's, it's the same idea, right? You notice that you have this long URL, but 
YouTube has an internal, um, an internal service that they use to shorten this URL so that you have the equivalent of that, right? It's much shorter and much easier to work with, I guess, right? And so these are all different applications of, um, of number systems. And like I was saying here for Bitly, for instance, um, the way that uh, it probably works is um, because each, each one of these URLs, so, so you, can, you can get this URL and shorten it and what you get back, the shortened version of the URL will be completely different from mine. So the way it probably works is that you use some sort of a unique identifier associated with whatever link someone wants to shorten. And then you use that identifier, typically a number to derive the equivalent base 36 or base 32 in this case, right? It's base 32 because you have uppercase, uh, uppercase of bit collators here. Do you understand this? Application domains, right? Now, in as much as the, we can go on and on and on to talk about the different usage scenarios associated with number systems, um, but our interest is 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 going to be in is going to be on specific types of number systems, specifically base two, uh, base sixteen, and base ten, right? So decimal, hexadecimal, and binary, essentially. Um, and so you you part of why we're doing that is very very soon. Um, once we start looking at, um, uh, uh, once we, 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 we go through a gentle introduction of MIPS assembler, for instance, you'll realize that uh, the simulator that we're going to be using is going to be representing, um, is going to be representing the outcome once we execute code using the simulator in a certain way. So you can choose to represent the output um, using decimal, using hexadecimal, or using binary, right? Uh, observe, if I open up uh, Qt Spim, for instance, we're going to be using Qt Spim. Um, what you'll notice is that uh, it represents, this is what I'm talking about here, by default, if you look at this left panel here, the one I'm highlighting here, immediately notice that by default here, at least my Qt Spim, my instance of Qt Spim, my integer register uh, uh, representing the values in binary, you see these ones and zeros, but I can I can change this, right? I can tell Qt Spim to say I want I want these numbers, pay particular attention to what's happening to these numbers. I want these numbers to, present, to be represented using hexadecimal format, right? So I, I have these numbers being represented as 3000FF10, right? I can also tell it to say I want to represent um, the values associated with the registers using decimal notation, which is really insane because for the most part, some of the numbers that you're working with are very, very large. And so it's, it's, it's better, it's much more intuitive at least for the average human being, and most human beings would like to think, it's better for you to represent a number in hexadecimal than in binary or in, 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 uh, in, in decimal notation, right? Observe, think about this for a second. Which one do you think is better? Do you want line number 26, 27, or 28? I don't know, I think it's 28 for me anyway, but to know what, what you think yourselves, right? Um, so so this this is coming come, this is coming very very soon, right? Where we get to inspect the status of the different registers um, as we're working with this simulator. <clears throat> um, but even better, uh, at some stage, once we start looking at uh, uh, specifics of how data is encoded by computers it turns out that it would be a lot more intuitive for us to better understand what happens under the hood um, by understanding base two. Because remember, a computer encodes everything, both data and instructions in so-called um, ones and zeros. Of course, we're abstracting the idea of electric flow of electric current here, right? It's saying uh, a one could signal the flow of electric current and the zero is no flow of electric current, or perhaps the one represents a high voltage and a zero represents a low voltage, right? So for us to be able to figure out exactly how a computer gets to figure out, say this is a red, this is a blue, this is maybe a pink or violet or whatever, um, we would need to understand this too, because it turns out that all of these things here, what you're seeing on the right, can be represented using ones and zeros, right? And we see this all the time in these uh, tools that we use, right? I don't know uh, your, your uh, image editing software of choice, 
but I use GIMP myself. And when I'm using GIMP, right, and I'm trying to, um, I wonder, I'm using GIMP and I'm trying to, to edit an image, for instance. I wonder if I can find an image. I'm trying to edit an image. Uh, part of what I would do is I'll play around with the colors, right? And when I'm playing around with the colors, right? Let's say I want this to be, for some weird reason, I want this to be red, right? This top, top right, I guess this section here to be somewhat red. What I could do is I could, uh, I could just uh, tell GIMP to say, I don't know if you can see this, but hope you can. I can tell, I'll just raise it slightly here, I guess to 150, I guess. I can tell GIMP to say, Listen, GIMP, I want this top right corner here to be represented in a certain color, right? Um, and I'll say fill with color or something. But the fill, well, before I fill with color, I'll change the color code. Now, when I'm changing the color code, observe, I can change the hue, the saturation, the equivalent of red, green, and blue, so that I come up with a particular combination of colors. All of these things, when I'm playing around with these, with these different, I wonder if there's a, a better way of representing this so that people understand. When I'm, when I'm altering this different combination of colors, I will arrive at, uh, I will arrive at a preferred color, right? Like if I choose red, I know it would be 255 somewhere here or something, right? Here, not exactly right here, but 255 here. If I want to get, uh, I don't know what red and blue give us, but maybe it's, I don't know what that is, but, but let's say this is what I want, right? Um, this is what I do, right? What I'm doing behind the scenes is I'm just playing around with bits. The numbers you're seeing here, the 255s, the, if I put a 100 here, you can represent these using bits. But it turns out that because a human being would typically be the one working with this sort of software, these numbers are represented in decimal, right? So this is a decimal number here. But this decimal number can pretty much be represented as ones and zeros. Depending on the bit depth, maybe if you're using um, a, a, a bit depth of eight, then the, then the number here, instead of 255, I don't know what the maximum is, but the number here will be represented, the maximum number that you have here will be representative of the bit depth that you're working with. Key takeaway point here is that data and instructions are, are perceived by a computer um, as ones and zeros, base two. A human being can abstract what a computer perceives as ones and zeros into either hexadecimal equivalent representation, decimal equivalent representation, or from a perspective of how the content would be viewed, right? When you, you more or less like, um, I'm gonna get everything and you combine everything. This is what you have here, but this is just a, a literal representation of ones and zeros, base twos, base two. Uh, it's not just colors, right? Um, even images can be represented as ones and zeros. In fact, a, a computer perceives an image as a one and zero, right? So, and if you've seen this, a, a typical image like this, like if we zoom in into this image, didn't get any photos of you guys, uh, so we are recycling photos from last year. It's quite sad, really. If you zoom in into a photo, what you notice is as it pixelates, right? You notice that each one, uh, each one, of, uh, you notice that the image is composed of so-called pixels, right? I don't know if you can see these uh, these small little boxes here that you see, here. small little boxes, yeah. Those pixels can be represented or are represented as ones and zeros, right? Just colors actually, by the way. So again, application of number systems, right? They're all over the show here. Um, you will soon discover that uh, these, these things that we type, I'm typing an assignment, right? They said we type it in English or whatever. I don't know if it's in Yanja, if you're doing languages. Those characters that you're working with, right? those characters that you're working with can be mapped onto the equivalent binary representation, the equivalent of what a computer sees. It's not like a computer sees an A, when you type an A, right? When you type A, or I'm typing I, C, T. The computer doesn't see I, doesn't see 
C doesn't see T. What a computer sees is when it sees uppercase I, it sees the equivalent of either 73 base 10 or 49 base 16, right? In fact, what a computer sees, when you type I, the computer sees that I as being, let me just change this to numerical presentation, uh, 49. What a computer sees is this. And of course, I mean, the representation, the bit representation is dependent on, uh, I, I guess this would be, Eight, eight bit representation actually. Eight bit. I don't know how to be represented. Yeah, eight bits. Depends on the architecture, I suppose. But yeah. So what, this is what a computer sees, right? Stream of ones and zeros. And and you can you can easily tell this, right? Um, if if you want, you can prove this by by just typing ICT or let's type I. Save this as uh, I hope this works as a uh, example. Uh, Encoding. Are you still there? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> if you want, you can. If you want, you can use hex editors like I use uh, Octator myself. I've been using it for quite some time for illustration purposes. And if I am to open that file that I just created, which just has an I, you'll notice that. Uh, I hope I'll be able to view this. You notice that you see that 49 there, I mean, it's the hex representation of I, right? So um, this is what, and I think I can change the view so that I see, instead of the I, I see the actual ones and zeros that the computer would probably see or something. I don't know how to, I, this is the thing, this is the problem when you, you use this tool. Oh, there we go. When you use this tool once a year or something, right? So this is what I'm talking about here. Instead of the I, I just opened this file that I just created. You notice that the the representation is zero one zero zero one zero zero one, right? And you see that zero one zero 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 one is the equivalent of if I come here zero one zero zero one zero zero one is equivalent of forty nine, right? It's just that uh, there's there's a there's a leading zero here because it has to, it's it has to be eight bit representation usually. Is this making sense? I wonder what one zero 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 is here. Look at this, right? The last part that's there, it's probably like some, some uh, courage return character or something. So the zero 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 one zero one zero is like one zero one zero. One zero one zero is like uh, A, right? So you go to your, uh, you can just go to your ASCII table and check what A is and uh, A hexadecimals in A, right? Decimal number 10. You check for decimal number 10 and you see that it's a line feed, right? So it's like that when you create, typically when you create a file like this, depending on what sort of tool you're using, there'll be a line feed character, a marker that the operating system uses to, to identify the end of the line or something. So it's a line feed, which is why my file here, Octeta thinks that my file has actually two characters, but the last one is the current, it's a line feed, right? This thing here at the end. Is this making sense? So, so just showcasing different areas, I mean, different applications for these things, right? Um, if you want to find out more about the ASCII table, if you want to go ahead of the rest of us, you can look up uh, the ASCII table and, uh, and, uh, and just, uh, I wonder if ASCII, hmm, I didn't know those ASCII code.com and ASCII table.com. Um, you can get ahead of the rest of us, even though we do discuss the uh, 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 data encoding uh, when we, we look at how text is encoded. And so we talk about things like uh, um, the ASCII table, we discuss the ASCII table, for instance, and different other text encodings like UTF, um, so that we get an understanding of how this is done. So if you're curious, I do encourage you to, is this, is this the Wikipedia page or maybe you should go to, Ah, this is good, ASCIItable.com is good. I do encourage you to go to ASCIItable.com. Okay. Key takeaway point here is uh, application of number systems. 